Morning all, I'd like to show you another amazing game from the Krakow Candidates Tournament of 1962. Bobby Fischer was playing Victor Korshnoy in round 5. Victor Korshnoy is a professional chess player author. Until recently, in December unfortunately, uh, he had a stroke of 2012. Uh, but until, until that time he was the oldest active Grandmaster on the tournament circuit. He is widely considered the strongest player to have never become world chess champion. Born in Leningrad, USSR, cautionally defeated, pardon me, cautionally defected to the Netherlands in 1976 and has been residing in Switzerland for many years. He played in, played three matches against Anatoly Karpov. In 1974, he lost the candidates final to Karpov, who was declared world chess champion in 1975 when Bobby Fischer refused to defend his title. He then won two consecutive candidate cycles to qualify the, for the World Chess Championship matches with Karpov in 1978 and 81. Fortunately, unfortunately for him losing both, he was a candidate for the World Championship on 10 occasions. 1962, so that's this tournament, was his first candidacy. 1968, 71, 74, 77, 80, 1983, 85, 88 and 91. He was also a four times USSR champion a five-time member of Soviet teams that won the European Championship and a six-time member of Soviet teams that won the Chess Olympiad. In September 2006 he was the World Senior Chess he won the World Senior Chess Championship. Now in this game it's greatly of great curiosity this game. Fischer played E4 and Viktor Korshno played the quite rare Perk Piertz defence. And Fischer has a fantastic record against this opening in general. Uh, but let's see what happens. d4, knight f6, and knight c3 prepares the dreaded Austrian attack. After g6, Fischer plays f4. So this is an Austrian attack system. One of the most feared systems to play against the Piert's defense. Victor plays bishop g7. After knight f3, Victor Cautionary Castles. And we see here in this position the move Bishop E2. Let's just check on live book. Bishop D3 is the much more common move, actually. 1890 games. Bishop E3, second most common, 489. Bishop E2, 255. Okay, so we see Bishop E2. And it's striking at the center, trying, under, trying to undermine white central control with C5. Okay, so now Fischer plays d takes c5, and already I think black is okay in the position of the queen a5. This isn't such a dangerous line, I think, for black. After castles, queen takes c5 check, king h1, knight c6. Fischer plays now knight d2. So in this position, this looks quite curious as well to play knight d2. Usually bishop d3 is played here. So maybe, you know, instead of bishop e2 earlier, bishop d3 straight away would have added support for the e4 pawn. Queen e1 is also popular here. Knight d2 a bit rarer, so knight d2. And this a5 is reminiscent of a more modern game which has actually been featured on this channel when two British grandmasters played. Nigel Short was playing John Spillman and a bit of an upset in inverted commas. Spillman wasn't meant to uh, destroy Nigel Short uh, but he did with the Piers defence and a similar strategy here to undermining that c3 knight. So there's something about this variation where these knights on the queen side seem a little bit more vulnerable than usual. So we see a knight coming to b3 to join the c3 knight. Queen b6. And now a4, which kind of loosens the b3 knight here. And you might think, well, this this is just really, is that exploitable? This this b3 knight? Is it that loose? Well, knight b4, okay, and it's tying down the queen to c2 here. And this is where uh there's a move which is very, very severely punished. 
In fact, I don't remember another Fisher move so severely punished so early on um, as this next move. First of all, I wonder if you can guess uh, Fisher's uh, move here, which perhaps Bishop e2 from the opening had the intention of supporting. That's my clue. So what did Fisher play in this position? What, what would you as an aggressive kind of, if you're an aggressive frame of mind, what would you consider playing here if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now? Okay, Fisher played G4. I think we remember in games in Metanov this kind of very aggressive kind of stuff. The bishop here, you know, maybe even sporting you know, F5 and G5 later with these bishops maybe extending in scope. But um, there's an absolutely fantastic conception by Victor Korshnoi here, which engines really like as well, but it's absolutely fantastic. Why absolutely falls apart soon after this next move. Can you see what black played in this position? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, Victor Korshnoi played bishop takes g4. Perhaps with the same idea knight takes g4 is also Interesting. The idea is to get this queen away from c2 for knight takes c2 to weaken this knight. So it's a peace sacrifice. Bishop takes g4, a temporary peace sacrifice. Knight takes g4, only one pawn so far. Now after knight takes c2, two pawns for the peace. But these knights are fragile. You might think, well, hang on a sec. Knight, isn't knight d5? Isn't knight d5 possible here to, to attack the queen? It doesn't really do anything, I think. Just just queen takes b3 and there's no, no attack. So, OK, we've got a rook attacked and we've got the knight attacked. So Fisher plays knight b5. But this is not the end of fragility or forcing moves. Victor Korshnoi now plays knight takes a1. And after knight takes a1, Another really crushing move is played in this position, uh, targeting a couple of vulnerable spots in White's position. So what would you play now if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now? It's a very simple but powerful move here for Black. The move is Queen C6. Queen C6 on the surface just attacks the e4 pawn. Looking deeper at it, it also supports the idea of rook c8 and queen takes c1, mopping up three pieces for the queen potentially. But furthermore, it also shows some extra vulnerabilities now. If queen c4 is played, that would be a double attack on a4 and f1. And these knights are not really getting much support. They're not having the most fantastic time on the chessboard. The knight on a1 in particular is not amused. This knight on b5 is not as not very amused as well. This bishop striking on the diagonal is taking away the d4 square. And if it loses a4, it's losing its supporting bases in this position. OK, so what can Fisher do here? It's starting to look grim. Maybe it's a case of lesser evil to minimise the damage time. And in that respect, against Queen c4, the move Queen f3 might be tried. But um, after f5, if we have a look at this, e takes, takes this kind of position is pleasant for black. Even though you know two pieces against a rook in, in theory should be okay, but there's no support for these pieces. They're quite loose here. Black has still threats like rook c4 to try and even pick up a4 here. But uh, Fisher actually continues with attacking inten intentions with f5. And now a very clinical move, as well as what was played, is actually rook a c8 just to threaten. Queen takes c1, but this next move is very strong as well. Just queen c4 attacking the rook, which wasn't protected with queen f3, and uh, the pawn. Now queen f3 is played, losing the a4 pawn, attacking the knight. 
and this knight. The knights are forked. Now we see knight c7. Queen takes a1. Victor doesn't see any danger in playing this. He's getting back his material. Knight takes a8. Uh, is tempting, but uh, if Fisher had played this, rook takes a8. And there isn't much going on on for white. You might think fg, fg looks a little bit scary for check. But in this position, after queen takes e7, if we have this position on the board, black has queen b1 attacking, keeping an eye on e4. Now queen d3, and he's just material up. And this is not pleasant for white. So, in fact, Fisher made his situation a little bit worse technically. He didn't even take the rook um, on a8 here. He played knight d5, so he's aiming to try and checkmate Victor Cautionary. But Cautionary is known for soaking up attacking resources. He is one player who has a fantastic record against Mikhail Tao. He relishes defense and counter attack. He played rook a e8 after bishop g5, which attacks his queen, and e7. He just calmly plays queen takes b2. Bishop takes e7. If knight takes e7, check here. Black can afford to play rook takes e7 to get rid of white's attack. And this position here, rook a8 is possible. Again, with the Fincetto bishop, the entries on f7 are not so dangerous here. The queen is covering the f6, so this isn't such a dangerous position. So if we go back, after queen takes b2, bishop takes e7 was played. Knight takes e7, we'll just play rook takes, but bishop takes e7. So what is white actually threatening? Well, Victor offers the exchange with bishop e5 and threatens mate. So actually, nothing's being offered here. It's threatening mate in one, which has to be parried. There are two ways of parrying it. Uh, either queen h3 or rook f2. In the game, we saw rook f2. If queen h3, I don't think that fares very well here. Queen e2. Threatening queen takes e4 and just getting this pawn going as well. This is a miserable position for white. For example, taking and there's no attack. H takes g and there's no attack here. Knight e7 check doesn't do anything, king g7. So in the game, okay, against this mate in one threat, rook f2 was played. We see check and the queen is coming back nicely and defensively and attackingly now off the rook f1 to h6, threatening mate again. h3 and now a very cold blooded move indeed is played in this position, undermining that white's central control. Victor Kaushnoy fearless plays a move which maybe some of us wouldn't consider too much in principle. He plays g takes f5 seemingly allowing this g file to be used against his king but is it of any consequence if we throw in a check here which wasn't played just king h8 and so what f6 is covered what's the big deal? There's nothing going on here and in fact, on bishop g5, you might think that's a bit dangerous, but then f takes, attacking the queen, queen g6, so what? So g takes f5 causes white some problems. If he plays e takes f5, white could be mopped up with rook takes e7, knight takes check, king moves, and now what? There's no attack. So White's attack after G takes F5 doesn't seem evidence, even though this G file might in principle seem a little bit dangerous. Fisher goes for Bishop takes F8, Rook takes F8, throws in the check, King H8, and at least 
optically has a nice looking light on f5 but with the dark squares all covered does this mean anything we see queen e6 which supports now a4 and queen b3 for the pawn to be further herded down the board as well as keeping an eye on h3 this is an ideal setup rook g1 and relentlessly playing a4 now and we see in this position rook g4 is there any threats on the horizon queen b3 is played and here you might think well surely white could at least try to double his queen and rook for some kind of cheapo on g8 this would be a nice dream and let's explore this dream here if queen g2 let's say a3 and let's say knight h6 so the threat of mate in one unfortunately if this had been played Fisher's dream would have been uh, this disrupted because black has the resource f5 protecting g8 the queen is multi-purpose here not just attacking defending key points and that would be terrible for white this position if takes then he could just play a2 and no nothing is stopping this pawn and there's no mating threats so Fisher played he didn't even go for the battery uh, he actually played the miserable queen f1 and the pawn relentlessly goes forward with a3 Fisher plays rook g3 and Victor Caution can play anything here he can play bishop takes g3 there's no harm in playing bishop takes g3 uh, because you know for example knight takes queen takes the queen's got g7 for any checks there's no perpetual check or anything uh, but uh, in the game we see actually the more cheeky queen takes g3 and Fisher has to resign here this pawn is getting back the queen pretty soon if knight takes g3 was played a2 there's nothing for white so I found this game I don't know about you on YouTube complete obliteration after g4 stunning obliteration showing how dangerous the perk defense can be comments or questions on YouTube Thanks very much.